Sinclair is the Agriculture Manager for the Wake Forest Farming Partnership. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be invited to uh, participate in uh, in this uh, event. Um, I think by this time you probably realise the common denominator in all of that, and that is Jim, of course. And <laughs> um, if I roll the clock back to ten years ago um, at Waitrose, and we were looking to raise the profile of agri-environment across a supply base. At that time, Jim was very much the, one of our uh, key account managers when we engaged with WAG um, to drive that activity. Um, and over the course of the last decade, we've had some really excellent relationships with Jim and now the move to here at Lorington and we continue um, to build on that. So, uh, yeah, I can see why uh, we were recruited. Anyway, um, Really keen to give you an insight into uh, how we operate, uh, and my role as agricultural manager is across all the livestock sectors at Waitrose. We're sourcing directly from just under 2,000 livestock farms uh, for all the different species. So I head up essentially our livestock steering group, but within the Waitrose Farming Partnership. We've got equivalent groups looking at fishing, both wild caught and farmed, and then the agronomy group, and I know some of you here know Alan Wilson, who's headed up the agronomy group, uh, and is really my equivalent on that side of the equation. But each of the groups looking at managing activity aimed at future-proofing the farming businesses uh, supplying us. A decade ago, we developed our uh, agricu agricultural strategy, and we're just at the point of now that we've got the new agricultural bill going back and refining that and looking to see where it needs to be updated. But I'm sensing that the four key pillars we established a decade ago that have stood us really well over the last decade, I don't think we're probably going to change a great deal in that. Um, and at that time, we were growing as a business quite strongly, much more about consolidation uh, these days and consolidating around being the best 5% multiple retailer on the land rather than chasing uh, market share. So a sort of return to being the best that we can and differentiating our offer uh, lends itself to more activity of the nature we'll touch on uh, in, in the coming period. But now what we... Um, from the environmental side, we're also tied in with the development of our first CSR strategy, the Waitrose Way, and particularly the second one there, the Treading Lightly axis of that. And that's where, through the work we did historically, we, we had it a requirement at one stage that all our livestock farms had to be a WAG member, uh, and then we moved away from that position. But that was tied in with that first iteration of our CSR strategy and of the other contributions I've touched on their CSR strategy, I'm going to end my piece with our, our new one. So we've, I work very closely with these companies, the agricultural teams uh, of these businesses that supply us with all our primary protein. Unlike most other multiple retailers, we generally have only one supplier of each of these products rather than two or three different suppliers. So Coon Farm, Robin will speak later, they look after their organic milk. Dalehead Foods, our pig meat and our lamb, Aquascot Farm Salmon. Grove Farm in Southern Ireland, some of our Christmas turkey. Stonegate, our eggs. <coughs> WD Farmers, the, the conventional milk. Group, Moy Park, our chicken. Gressingham, uh, duck, geese and turkey. Duckett Park, our beef, venison and veal and Anska Foods are uh, New Zealand lamb. So that is the group that I do a huge amount of my, my time is spent working with the agricultural directors, the agricultural teams. <coughs> As a group, they've got between 60 and 70 field officers that's up and down the farm drives that manage the day-to-day -day relationship with our farmers. They're what I call our sort of silent army, the people that's got the pulse at grassroots, and are also important to us to understand issues that arise. So if we're going to do any initiatives, we've got to make sure the field officers are comfortable and bought in to doing anything before we do anything. Really important. 
As a group, we've been together for roughly 12 years, uh, and two years ago, we had an event at the House of Lords just to celebrate the achievements of the group, and we pulled together this document, a dec decade of collaboration. And it's truly unique to see how the range of these different businesses working together to deliver our strategy, how it's all sort of coming together. Without them, I would really, really struggle. Um, I'm a one-man band, uh, very reliant on their teams delivering our agenda uh, for us. And they've come to you know, uh, develop really good relationships as a community across the piece over that last 12 years. But for today, our motivation um, really stems from the National Pollinator Strategy launched in, in 2014. Uh, and many of you will be well aware of that, so I'm not going to touch on that. But it really came about, the pollinator strategy was launched. I was chatting to Jim around, well, what could we do across our livestock supply chains to make a contribution towards the ambitions of, of that? So that led to the development of our pollinator package. So we sat, sat in this very building um, towards the end of 14, beginning of 15, and looked at how we could develop some uh, advice, support, and appropriate mixes uh, that could go out onto our supply base uh, to contribute. So the three key areas we were looking at was around resource protection, soil, water, hedgerows, nectar flower provision to support pollinators, and then a winter food supply provision of winter seed. And really because of that diversity of farming system, allowing our farmers to choose combinations and permutations to suit their own circumstances. So just a quick snap of some of the farms that are part of our, uh, our supply chain. So on, on beef, we require the beef cattle to graze one season at grass. On conventional dairy, a minimum of 120 20 days grazing. Uh, on our pig meat supply, all, all 55,000 sows are outdoors. All our, our egg, uh, hens, laying hens are outdoors, free range. We've got about 30% market share of organic and free range chicken. Um, and when we decided to do something, the best place is always is to come here. So that was the various supply chains here on a bit of a study tour a couple of years ago, learning about what the mixes could deliver. Lamb, beef, and uh, surprisingly in Southern Ireland, they've probably been some of Richard's best customers for the mixes where we're using um, the paddocks and enrichment they are providing cover for the turkeys. And so well, let's just uh, not mention it's only 30 days and counting for you to do that. <laughs> Within our business, we've, we've got a significant number of higher welfare um, uh, supply chains. Chicken would be a good example, uh, where we work with Moy Park, uh, and again, come back to the sort of 30% of our chicken is either organic and free range. Uh, lower stock and densities, making use of smaller family farms. A lot of the uh, chicken farms in, in Northern Ireland are under 80 acres in size, so for not a couple of chicken sheds has allowed the next generation of the family family uh, to come back home uh, and what we've done there is really look at how we can develop the ranges um, to suit the birds. So we start with the shed, put trees around it uh, and if we look at the estate we've got with Moy in Northern Ireland, some like 70,000 trees have been planted, um, typically 100 trees on either side of the house that you can see the roads there that allows the birds they, to go out, enjoy the, 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 the range, um, and then looking at using some native trees um, and providing really flexibility for the, uh, for, for the farmers to choose what, what are the best options. So we've been working with one of um, Jim's former colleagues um, across there uh, and also providing the opportunity for some of the um, some of the, the free range guys to look at developing biodiversity plots, uh, wildflower strips, and we're now in a process where we want to move that forward. That even the chicken, uh, the, the indoor chicken guys have the option now to try and do a bit their contribution, as it were, 
around the houses in terms of enhancing the biodiversity. So I was across there three weeks ago and within the last two weeks we've signed up a dozen of the farms that are going to get involved and look at how they can make more of a contribution around the area, around the sheds, uh, that is a sort of biosecure area. The other big what, um, supply chain I'm just going to touch on that's really important for us and making sure we get the environmental aspects correct is a pig supply chain. Um, all 55, sorry, all 45,000 sows are outdoors their entire lifetime. Uh, and the pigs are very much part of the arable rotation, particularly in East Anglia. We need light draining soil, so we're quite often in competition with some of the vegetable companies for that land. And, in, and of late, um, people growing maize for AD plants seems to be the vogue and the, and the, the biggest amount of competition. Um, but because we're only on these estates or part of the rotation for two seasons, we need to make sure we hand back the land in as good a condition uh, as possible. So again, we're working with um, Richard and the team is looking at how we can establish that green cover before the pigs ever arrive on the land, be that free range finishing or um, a, a breeding unit uh, to make sure we've got the, the crop established root structure there to make sure that we're, 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 we're absorbing as much uh, the nutrients from the pigs as possible and, and managing against any diffuse pollution. Uh, and again, you know, that's where the expertise the King Seed team provide is really important. Before a pig set, sets foot on any of the land, we undertake, and this was something that was introduced about a decade ago, there's an environmental assessment of every site undertaken before we set up the farm um, to assess it for the suitability uh, for pigs. So that gives recommendations around paddock layout, soil management, given soil type, groundwater protection zones, etc. Um, previously, um, Suffolk Flag was doing that, and now there's a combination of Suffolk Flag and, and Richard and the team at Frontier that are providing that. So we need that to be done on our timetable, uh, and that's where, you know, as a commercial business, I would say our pig business is really very commercial in that when they say they want something done, it needs to be done. Um, so you know, the fact that Frontier have walked over 1,700 hectares in, in under a year just demonstrates how much area we, we, we have to cover. But it's a really vitally important tool, this, in terms of making sure that we're doing everything right uh, and we're not going to fall foul of uh, any issues. Because in many of these farms, the landlord is still retaining the single payment and therefore the responsibility in cross compliance, the pig farmer needs to be in the right place. So looking ahead on that supply chain, it's really looking at how we can take the pollinator project forward, see what, are other, what other ways we can support the establishment of that green cover crop. And I think there's also a lot more we could do around the margins of some of the, um, the pig farms um, to provide for, for the pollinators uh, moving forward. Just want to touch on a bit of work that we've, we started off about four or five years ago um, that was developed in conjunction with Aberystwyth University. We used to fund a chair in, in agriculture uh, at Aberystwyth and one of the things that Professor Nigel Scullin used to challenge us around was the fact that we had an awful lot of data on each farm we had and was there a better way we could package that up into uh, an assessment of best practice. So that led to the development of our REP index. Uh, and during 2016-17, uh, we did the first iteration of that. Uh, and that was all about you know, looking at that best practice to demonstrate we could show continuous improvement across all the supply chains. Um, and then where there were issues, how we could have targeted programs of knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange, much as we heard from this morning's uh, contributions um, to make sure we had greater resilience or efficiency uh, in the supply base and using the database created to target knowledge exchange um, in the future. So in the last 12 months we've decided that after iteration one and slicing together roughly 100 spreadsheets 
was time to invest in money, develop a tool. So all our supply chains, we've collectively invested in uh, buying time on the Authenticate Information Services uh, platform. So we're now going to do iteration two of all the 1980 forms on this. And Robin has been out and about and been busy doing the organic um, supply chains. But this is just an example of you know, the report that the farmers will get in terms of what their total score is, the good and bad bits. Then breaking down into the different sections, whether that's soils, nutrition, climate change, biodiversity, ecology, health, animal health, economics. And then at a supply chain level, we, we can then look to see what's the difference between the best, the average and the poorest score on each of the sections. Um, and I think this is the, the important bit for us, is how we can then collectively work with the supply chains to take forward initiatives. Uh, and for me, it's all about how we reduce the variance across each of these axes. And that, for me, is the opportunity we've got within our supply chains to either run activity that's supply chain specific or ruminant versus monogastric in terms of there could be different approaches. Um, but as a tool, it just gives us a bit of peace of mind that we have got, even within our supply chains, we've got variations. Um, on the farms, and there is an opportunity then to drive uh, further activity. So just want to end by just touching on our OCSR strategy. Um, this has just recently been refreshed, um, and it's all about, for us, uh, making sure all that we do in our business uh, is partner-led. Um, as a business, there is 90-odd thousand partners in the John Lewis Partnership, but 65,000 of them work for Waitrose, the food shops for the partnership, and everyone in the business has a say in how it's run. So it's, a, it's an incredible sort of feat of democracy in terms that everybody um, can, can make their voice heard. So we're committed to always partner-led, a better way um, on this new access for the, for the love of food. And it's about deciding, you know, in terms of our priorities, what are the ones we want to enhance, um, set the agenda and lead the market on? What are the ones we need to sustain that there would be an expectation by our customers that we would be doing the right thing and we would expect that of Waitrose? And then the bottom one is around future-proofing our strategy. And so I think the work we've done here, um, working with Kings and across our supply chains, so it falls into both the sort of stain and in the opportunity <coughs> is probably more around enhancing uh, as we move forward. And so the, the three key areas, the, the strap lines as it were, that we're now working to is always fair, making sure we've got the strongest partnerships with farmers and most sustainable and ethical farming fishing practices, never wasteful, leading on the way on sustainable packaging, tackling food waste from farm, and that's more about fresh produce rather than livestock, and transforming lives, the best at supporting the health and well-being of our customers, partners, and the communities in which we trade. So very similar to the two presentations of the CSR commitments we heard from earlier. And at the bottom there, while I'm sure we're managing all the relevant issues, at least as well as our peers, and getting prepared for emerging issues. So I hope I've given you a bit of an insight into how we run our schemes, uh, a couple of the examples of where this initiative um, has, has gone in the last couple of years, where it might be heading, and I'm going to hand across to Richard.